Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Another exciting package from Matt Harlem at Live 2. I think this is the right bag. It's looking a bit small. Though. Maybe I've got the wrong bag here. Could be two of these bags. Let's just have a look. Yeah, there's two of these bags. This is one bag. So he sent me some uh, goodies here. Um, now, I was asking to buy one of these, and he said, oh, I'll send you a couple. Don't worry about it. This is another Agnes board. Day Agnes, so this will be another video. So, what is a Day Agnes? I'll just mention that now. It allows you to fit an 8372A with uh, a mega RAM uh, there into a board that needs an 8375. And I've got a build of a new Amiga board coming up that needs an 8375. That's the socket that's on there. So, this will allow me to use one of my 8372As, and it will cover that in another video. So, he's kindly sent the uh, some of the uh, uh, header things there for that and the two RAM chips uh, to make one of these because obviously you have a, a half a meg 512k hang on yeah 256 times 16 yeah 512k on each side so I've got enough of those to build one of those and I've got a spare board so yeah I could always source the chips and build another and some Agnes sockets so thank you very much for those that will be as I say another video but then we've also got some more goodies the main focus of this video so you can see RAM so I'll open that in a sec and a lovely PCB and some components here. Look at that. Just look at that. That is gorgeous. I like the colour as well. I like the, the dark green on that. That is really nice. And it's, you know, it's fully gold plated here. Gotta go faster. <laughs> it's brilliant. What a brilliant name. I don't know who came up with that. Well, the, I think um, Liv may have had uh, someone suggest that actually. I'll uh, again post a link down to Liv 2's GitHub page down below. So yeah, we've got some uh, uh, spaces here for what I think are probably transceivers, some resistor networks, CPLD, uh, RAM, crystal, uh, regulator, caps, JTAG header, and ooh, quite a few cap positions on the underside, so yeah, lots of uh, decoupling there. Uh, but this is a uh, 256 megabyte Zorro 3 RAM board. So, yeah, I am uh, uh, can't wait to get this built, actually. Get this into my 4000. Now, one thing I can see coming straight away, I'll probably have to remove the uh, TF4060 Proto. I've sort of been on the fence with that for a while, thinking I'm, as much as you know, I want to keep it, and it's a cherished part of my collection, the 4060, I'll probably have to take it out, because I can't use Zorro stuff with it. That's the problem. It's fine as it was with a standalone machine, but I've now got some cards like this that I'll want to get in there. And uh, it just, yeah, current firmware doesn't support it. And, yeah, I'm, I've struggled to try and update the firmware. I know Stephen's moved on. He's obviously got a new revision board and stuff. So at some point, I'll buy one of those, and I'll assemble one of those, and that will be the, uh, you know, the 4060, hopefully, that goes in there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we'll perhaps revert in this video. We'll test it first with the 4060, but I'm assuming it's not going to work. I tried an RTG card in there the other day, and whilst it booted okay, it didn't report the right uh, amount of RAM. It actually said uh, 64K, not 2 meg. And that's not the 64K for the AO, which was listed there as well. So, yeah, I think it's not going to work with this. But you never know, it may do. Um, I mean, that would be amazing if it did work with it, then, yeah, it'd be over the moon. But, so, yeah, so that's all that's in that bag. But he's kindly, I think, is this the one? Yes, he's put the components here, look. So we've got all the small bits and pieces here. He didn't have the CPLD, I don't think, but I think I've got some here. Assuming these are the right ones. Uh, let's just carefully lift that. Yeah, they look like the right ones. So it's another one of these uh, China eBay special. But they do look genuine, and they're in the genuine, you know, the sort of container they come in when you order them from DigiKey or RS or Farnell. So, yeah, there's a bit of fluff there on that one. But anyway, I think those should be okay, so we'll stick one of those on. Perhaps do that first. Um, and then we've got, in fact, I'm not going to do that first. I'll get all these small bits on first. Um, yeah, all the bits and pieces here, so absolutely brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Matt. It's, uh, it's really nice that you've... Uh, you know, your own cost and expense and stuff, you've shipped this out to me, you know, the cost of the PCB, the parts, and here's the RAM, look, let's just carefully open this up. Yeah, look at that. So, yeah, very nice, that's just uh, attached itself. You've got to be careful with this, because obviously the little bits of foam can attach, there we go, and uh, bend the pins if you're not careful. Yeah, I think we need to straighten one or two of those. But, uh, yeah, so he's uh, included the uh, RAM as well. I can't even read what's on that. It looks like there's little lines through it. Can you see that? <laughs> it looks like they're all line crossed out. What the... What was going on there? 
yeah, I had to inspect that with magnification, but they, they've been crossed out. <laughs> it's MT RAM, but there's lines through everything. That is really weird. <laughs> I don't really understand why you would do that. Unless it was... Maybe they were scored when they were in a machine or something that manufactured them. I don't know, these are like stock that got rejected, but there's nothing wrong with them. I don't know, it's a bit weird that. Post your comments down below. Why are these three lines through all of the print on them? Anyway, we can obviously do a full memory test of stuff uh, when we get going. Uh, right, let's uh, start with the underside. I'll do all these little fiddly, piddly 0.1s, I think, first. Right, about 20 minutes later, got all the little caps on there. Uh, they're pretty wonky, as you'll see. Some of them are wonky. Uh, you know, they're not aligned straightly. So I'm just going to use some hot air to straighten them all up. But before we do that, I'll get one here. Now, I've got two of the caps he's giving me here, tens, which I think are probably for that side there, for the regulator. So, yeah, we're kind of one short for that larger pad placement there. I could use one of the one, uh, the hundreds, you know, 100 nanofarads. But I've got one here that came uh, from... Uh, I think this came from Live 2 actually, or Sparks UK. It was with one of the, I think it was Sparks UK, this one, this cap. It was a spare. You can see it's just one cap in there on its own. And I think it's either a 1 or a 10 or it could be a 22. Um, I'm hoping it's uh, smaller than 10. There we go. Yeah, what I'm going to do is just put that on there. Yeah, this one is, does ESR, it won't do capacitors that small. It's not designed for testing, uh, you know, the actual size. It's all about the ESR. So the tricky, th <laughs> so this is really hard to do, got to press the test button and then try and probe it. Yeah, it's actually about 4.7, it's showing 6 microfarad there. So I'm happy sticking that on the underside of here, so 4.7 is pretty, pretty low. That will do the job, and it's not polarised. You can tell because there's no band or marking or anything, it's just a beige sort of colour as you get the capacitors there, which shows that it's uh, it's like a ceramic. It's probably one of those uh, MLCC, a multi layer. It's not a tantalum, is the key. If it was a tantalum, there'd be a marking to show which way's the uh, positive. Anyway, you get the idea. I've done that with all of the other ones on there. Just mounted them that way, so yeah, they're technically a little bit wonky, like I say. So we'll use some hot air now and straighten them all up. Uh, you can see I've got a, a, an electrolytic here as well for that, because I think, uh, yeah, he didn't provide one of those. And it, it probably doesn't need it, but I've said this before, whenever I see a pad spacing for something, I stick something there. Um, yeah, so, brilliant. Just waiting for them to, there you go, that's pulled itself into position pretty much. Uh, and that is all I'm going to do. There might be the other one where I just tap it. Yeah, there we go. Just to try and get it a little bit straighter than it, it's kind of pulled itself. Um, because sometimes they don't always pull themselves bang in the middle. Depends how much sold you've got. If you've got a large amount on each side, it will generally pull itself bang into the middle, but not always. That one's not moving. Oh, there it is. But you do tend to find that after a few taps, you can actually knock it well out of position if you're not careful. Right, there we are on uh, macro, so you can see they're not too bad. There's probably the odd one that may be a little misaligned. That one looks like it's too far to the right and the left. But uh, anyway, that's those. So we just need to focus on this side. Uh, again, I think I'll get some of these smaller things on. So the LM1117, uh, which is an AMS1117, I think, they're effectively the same thing. I uh, could be wrong. Unless this is the one that's got the different pin out. Uh, yeah, we'll solder this on, so I'm just going to get uh, a little bit of solder onto one pad here. There you go, you can see it moved when I did that. And that's often what will happen. The uh, solder will uh, pull the component a little bit, so I'm just going to just adjust it. Oh, ever so slightly. So 
So you can see uh, that's the regular uh, done. There we go, that's just two ceramics on. I've got the electrolytic there as well. Uh, technically, it probably doesn't let's say need that electrolytic, but I can't resist a pad. That's what it is. So we've got the crystal here. And uh, the speed of that is 66.666. Recurring, it's like the number of the beast or whatever. Uh, pin one is up there. Does it mean it goes that way around? I think it does. Yeah, so yeah, we just need to get that into position. We'll uh, just get some solder, crazy amount of solder onto one pin here like this. The key is the flux, by the way, because the flux is what will... Yeah, you see that's stuck, that's correct. We'll just move it a little bit. Oh. Yeah, I'll uh, need to, uh, obviously, let's say, do this with magnification because I cannot see what I'm doing. I'm just going to just move it a little bit there. Right, that'll do. Yeah, again, I messed around with that far too much. Yeah, not sure if you spotted that. This is R2 down here. I fitted a 100 nanofarad cap there. I got a bit carried away with the capacitors, so let's uh, just add a bit of solar here. And uh, there we go, wipe that off. There we go. So, yeah, I need to get a. Uh, resistor there. So I've got two different sizes of resistor here. I've got some 1Ks and 33 ohms that he's provided. So I just need to just go work out which which one is R2. Yeah, the interesting thing is, I'm not sure if he's done a revision, R2, he's got 10K on GitHub, yet yeah, he sent me 1K. So I'm going to uh, fit 10K, actually. We've also got that 1K we can revert to if there's a problem, but I'm going to go with what he's got on his uh, GitHub. So again, this component has come from uh, Sparks UK. It's one of the ones that was left over. Yeah, I think it is. That could be uh, Live 2's Ryan. It's one of the projects one of those guys sent me previously and there was like one extra resistor or something as a spare. You know, it probably needed one and someone's kindly sent me two. So yeah, I'll always keep those uh, just in case. So yeah, it's coming handy here, isn't it? Got the 10k there. Whenever I put a resistor on a board, it always lands the side where the print is not facing upwards. How does that work? I could like empty ten of them out of a thing like that and every one of them will be upside down. It's like they somehow know to land the wrong way up. Technically this is just a bit big this resistor actually, isn't it, physically? Yeah, that's pretty straight. I could always heat it with hot air if it's bugging me. And you know what, it is bugging me, it's not straight at all. So yeah, we'll just get the hot air on there. Alright, now it's straight. So resistor arrays on. <laughs> Some of them are very rock wonky as you can see. It's just a case of, uh, you know, get anchoring a couple of points and then just get some solder and just drag like that. If you've still got solder on your tip, remove it. You know, if you get a big blob, and then just reflow again. So anyway, we can eat that with hot air. Let's uh, get those nice and straight. And then the final thing is uh, transceivers, RAM, and CPLD, and we can program it. Yeah, I will need to join a wire for five volts somewhere because this uh, just assumes perhaps using a Pi or something like that. Um, it's always handy if uh, anybody designing the board in future, for me, <laughs> in particular, could add a 5 volt ground pin header somewhere. Um, but it's not a big deal because you could just program it in situ in your Amiga. That's uh, one thing you could do. Because then it will be powered. And that's perhaps what Liv's uh, been doing testing. But also, as I say, it's probably using a Raspberry Pi or something to program. And if you're using that, you don't need the uh, 5 volt pin header. Surprising how long these take to heat up, despite the fact they're tiny little things. It's uh, probably more hot air that's, uh, there we go, that's strained up. Not as good as it should be. Yeah, and that one's strained up as well. It's amazing how those just pull themselves into position. I wish the caps had uh, pulled themselves uh, as nice as that. So it's all on the tip, actually. You can see the shape of the tip there. This is the Antex, so just get a little bit of solder on there. So I'm trying to do this without burning the camera. So yeah, I got the solder on there, and we'll just have a, uh, oop, a little slide down there like that. I've got something there. Look. Yeah, wipe the solder from the tip. And then we've got a bridge on the end there that I can't just about see through the viewfinder. 
but you can see that's now gone. So exactly the same thing with the next one. Just have a slide along here. But then when you get that bridge, just uh, bob in and out. See, that's gone. So pin one on these was at bottom left here, yeah, on each of those four. On these large RAM chips here, pin one is bottom left here. So I'm going to get that RAM on next, I think. You could argue program the CPLD first and, you know, minimising risk of ESD and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I've got wrist strap on. So I'll get these four on next. So we're on macro here. It's going to be out of focus. It's going to get a relatively large blob of solder on there. This is the last side. So pretty close here. I'm going to melt the screen if I'm not careful. Uh, it's in case of tilting inwards. And just drag it really slowly like this with the flux there. And you can start to see... Yeah, that's working. But you start to run out of solder as it absorbs it. Get quite a few bridges there. Let's get some more solder. These chips have been the hardest bit so far, if I'm honest. I've got too much solder now. Yeah, so you can see we've got a bridge here, and a bridge there now. Just keep sort of pulling in and out like that at different angles, and then just wipe the solder off the tip. And uh, let's just give that another blow. I'm trying to do this without magnification, so I can't really see very well. No, anyway, you get the idea, that is, I think, just about it. And I don't think we have any bridges, so I don't know. There's something that looks a bit suspicious in the middle there, look. I think the solder's not flowed onto the pads there. So as simple as this builder has been uh, so far, well, it's been a bit time consuming. I've been at this for hours. I've been in here for about three or four hours so far doing this. Maybe three hours. Um, I've had no lunch or anything, so you know what? I'm going to clean up here now and uh, go and get some lunch, I think. Be careful with the cotton, but just in case the pin's not, you know, soldered down. Last thing I'm going to do is uh, bend it out of position. I will toothbrush it in a minute, and it'll go in the ultrasonic at the end. Right, that isn't bad, actually, as uh, things stand. I did have to use braid in a few places there, but uh, yeah, that's not too bad. So I'll just clean that up and we'll go and try and program it. So I'm filming this little bit at the end here. This is the uh, way I programmed it up. So I connected uh, this into the programmer. The order there is correct. CMS, TDI, TDO, TCK, ground, VCC. And I just confirmed that because they're marked on the board. And ju I just plugged it in and the holes there, just bent it over at an angle. Now, it's important if you do that, uh, that you don't lose the ground, otherwise you'll get uh, a latch-up type fault. So, obviously, uh, in this case here, you need to power the board with the regular, the 3.3 volt regular that I just showed you the pin out for that a minute ago. You need to power with the uh, ground and uh, 5 volts. So, I have another USB cable here. It's just an old phone cable that has a pin header thing here. And I just literally plug that into there like that. Yeah, so I have 5 volts on the top, ground on the bottom, and then just solder those onto the uh, appropriate pins on the regular. It's like, I think it's pin 1 is ground, pin 3 is 5 volts. And then when we connect this up, the green light will illuminate there. But you could use a Raspberry Pi. There's a guide, a link below on Live2's page to use a Raspberry Pi if you don't want to invest the 25 or so quid in one of these. The problem with these as well is the software. I use I think it's uh, version 10.1 of Impact. Download that from the Xilinx website. Um, it's free to download, but it doesn't work properly on Windows 10 and Windows 11. So it's probably easier to use a Raspberry Pi. So I've launched Impact 10.1 and closed that. Double click on boundary scan and then we right click to choose initialize chain. That's picked up the CPLD. Select the .jed file I downloaded from GitHub earlier. And click OK, right click and choose program. And we could just right click and choose verify to just double check it's alright. 
right we are all programmed up what's going to happen uh, well i know there's no shorts on the power side of things because obviously we we're able to program it and i tested temperature while i was just powering the uh, regulator here with five volts uh if you need to do what i do connect uh, a cable i had this connected to program it up uh, just to give me uh, five volts and ground the uh, ground is the first pin there yeah the middle pin is 3.3 .3, and the uh, right hand side here is five volts in so i'm trying this on the 4000 we've had over a number of different videos but uh, yeah i'll put one of them there um, i'm using andy trickle banks a3640 here it's here for uh, another board that i've been building for andy which i am having problems with actually uh, hang on yeah but anyway it's got my processor in there 40 megahertz one Let's just try it with that. I want to try it with the 3640 first because it's a level playing field. I suspect that it will work okay with that. And then I can try the TF4060. So just making sure it boots. Yeah, it is booting there, so I'll switch it off. Now you can see we've already got the SID card in here at the moment. I think what I might just do is just remove that. I'm going to put the SID card underneath. Um, a couple of slots down, actually. Just because I would like... The uh, RAM board at the top, yeah, you can see that's not going in right. That SID card probably needs a little bit of shaving off it. Yeah, definitely needs a bit of shaving off it because that's quite tight. Uh, but if we put it this way up, now I'm assuming, yeah, it says front. Yeah, it's got to go that way, hasn't it? You'd hope. Let's just, uh, I'm going to carefully switch it on here. Yeah, enough of getting hearts booting. Yeah, you can see the uh, ID LED flashing there, so first signs are nothing has died. So with this combination, we've only got 16 mega RAM on board. So let's just see what it reports. Top right. Oh, ho, ho, look at that, 278 meg. Oh, that's crazy, crazy amount of RAM. 200, quarter of a gig, quarter of a gig of RAM. Ugh. So that is uh, yeah, staggering the amount of RAM, isn't it? Someone on uh, Discord asked, I think it might have been Andy, actually said, how many of these can you fit? And uh, Live2 said, uh, up to a gigabyte. You can have four of them. So he's like, hey, here I come. He's ordered four. <laughs> so yeah, obviously, if you filled the Zorro free address range there with a, a gigabyte of that RAM, um, you haven't got much space for anything else. Um, you have in terms of I.O., I think. I think the I.O. can overlap. So yeah, that's very cool. That is very cool. Where am I going here now? Yeah, what I was trying to do is find sysinfo, just to have a look what it says about the boards and things. If we're going to see the boards here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, 256 meg, Zorro 3. <laughs> hey! So, of course, we need to test that. One game that I'm aware of, which would fill more than the 16 meg, is Beneath the Steel Sky, the CD version. Because, if you got, certainly if you've got preload, the free preload flag set, and the reason being is because there are so many discs for that. It came on to like 13 discs or something like that, but the CD version's got all the FMV stuff and it caches everything. It's uh, a good one to test RAM. When I loaded that on my ACA1220 that had 128 meg, I'll be waiting literally five to 10 minutes for it to load. You know, the progress bar goes up, up, up really slowly. Come back about 10 minutes later, so it's loaded it. Um, let's set the cache uh, thing if we can, just check it's where it's set. Yeah, preload set. So let's give that a try. Now I'm assuming this is going to behave how I'm thinking it's going to behave and take a while to load. Yeah, we're into that RAM now. See, it says 240 meg at the top there. Because, uh, yeah, you may think 256 or we're lower than that, but we started at like 270 or 280 or something, even though we've only got 256 plus 16 because it's, you know, it's times 1024. So yeah, look, 224 now. We, we, we are going into that RAM. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see if this works. Obviously, I will do uh, you know, a test. I'll boot a uh, test kit in a minute. And uh, we'll leave it doing a pass. I would imagine one pass would take uh, a number of hours, probably. And this is the other thing, actually, when you think about it. If you added a gig of RAM into a system like this, how usable would that be? You've got to think about your, you know, your disk I.O. It's all very well if you've got Lightwave on there and you've got a ton of, uh, you know, a, a fast SCSI drive, maybe 8 meg per second or something, which you can get. I've had a few people going, you can't get 8 to 10 meg on the mini. Yes, you can. I've got a, a few friends who've sent me, sent me screenshots of their SCSI controls, and I saw one on Futures 8-bits video as well, where you can get between 8 and 10 meg. 
on SCSI 2 with um, a specific accelerator that sits into the uh, you know the CPU slot there on a 3000 or a 4000 look 190 meg so yeah it's still going down yeah anyway I cut myself off yeah so you need pretty fast uh, you know disk throughput in order to fill that RAM don't you I can't really think how you would use a gig of RAM to be honest so it's a nice idea to max out your machine but I think 256 meg is uh, more than enough for anybody it's nice to know my uh, 1200 wasn't that slow with the ACA 1220 because you know what it's been about 9 or 10 minutes and we're still here loading <laughs> the hard disk is still going away we're down to 174 meg now up from, well down from what was it 270 of it report originally so we're well into that uh, other RAM I think as I said I think the FMV stuff's going to sit in there probably here we go it's loaded hey what's going to happen I haven't got uh, sound connected actually I really should just plug those in that's one, there's the other one. So, yeah, it's not uh, bombed or anything. Let's just let the intro go through. English, uh, play. Hey, it's working all right. I mean, I've got to be honest, using preload on this game is a bit crazy. Who wants to wait, like I did, roughly 10 minutes to play it? It's like you must be loading it from tape. It'll be quicker from tape. But this is a very good test. I like to do this as a test for, uh, you know, RAM. Sure, that intro actually. I think it doesn't cut to the fact, you know. I'm pretty sure it does. <laughs> yeah, there are a number of versions of this where I've heard that nee noise, and I'm not sure that's right. He could be right. Is this the talky one? I think it might be actually the CD version. Yeah, it is. That noise is really annoying. I don't think that's normal, that noise, but I've heard that on uh, a number of different versions. This does it on the 1200. It does it on the 2000, I think. Anyway, that works. Uh, I need to connect a keyboard now, don't I? Uh, memory, there we go, 272 meg. So, test uh, list and test regions. So, we'll do the 256 meg there. Uh, test memory range. Yeah, so that is going to take quite a while. I'm not even sure I've got time to wait for that just now so I think what I'll do is I'll swap back over to the 4060 we'll see if it starts to work or not with that because uh, I actually need to go out in a minute I need to go and uh, go to the uh, chemist but I also need to get some chips for tea and uh, yeah it's gonna shut so where's the card? Yeah I expect this is not gonna work uh, I'll be very surprised if this does work just based on the fact that none of my other Zorro cards uh, work with this. Including the, I think I tried, like I say, I mentioned earlier, I tried the RTG card and that wouldn't work either. Let's, oh, hang on a minute, I've got a trap wire trap there. Oh, what's the problem with them? These wires like this. There we go, just pull it out on top. Right, so let's push that back down. We'll stick that back into there I think if I can there we go so it's fans connected I think we'll move that out of the way let's just see what happens with the 4060 yeah, you've got the lines so that's still a boot and test kit let's see what that says memory wow it seems to be detected actually 336 meg <laughs> that is really amazing isn't it wow I'm surprised why does this work but other things don't and it does, it works. So, wow, I'm even happier now because I can use my 4060 with a quarter of a gig of RAM. Uh, it's got 64 mega RAM on it already, local fast RAM. I actually think I may install Lightwave actually at some point, maybe do a video on that, have a play around with it. 
because I think that might be uh, just something interesting to do. So I booted up with the 4060 there, and in system we can see 256 meg there, it's RM3, reserved the manufacturer, and uh, 64k, 64k? Uh, yeah, that's right, in terms of boards, but not RAM. So, yeah, because it's not, the, the, the terrible fire RAM is not Zorro RAM, is it? It's local RAM, I don't know how that's allocated, where it's allocated, but uh, memory. We'll show up there, yeah, 64 meg, 32 bit local public kick. So that's the RAM native to the 4060, you know, the CPU there, 16 meg of uh, Ramsey uh, access RAM. Uh, 256 meg, 32 bit RAM public kick. Yeah, and then obviously the chip RAM as well, which has got DMA support. So, where's the priority? So that's priority 20. Priority 30 is the local, so that's a higher priority. 40 is the, yeah, the local fast RAM. So, actually, it's the lowest priority, isn't it? So that RAM is taking lesser priority over the 16 meg onboard, and the onboard 16 meg is taking a lower priority than the 32 bit local fast RAM. So, that's as you would expect, really. I wonder if we can do a bus test or something. What can we, I don't know, break that down in any kind of way? Let's try that. So it did take about half an hour that actually to get around roughly, it might be 20, 25 minutes ish. But yeah, it's on round two. It's gone around the whole 256 meg, no errors. So the experienced Amiga users out there are going to be uh, aware of this sort of thing. But can you see how slow this is running? This is a consequence of having Zorro 3 RAM. So it's nothing specifically slow about Lib's board here. This is what happens though, if you uh, rely on that RAM, it's uh, so slow. And uh, I know that that's the issue, because when I started up, I saw the RAM drop by a significant amount at the top of the screen, down to about 70 meg free. So I thought, that looks like that's used about 250 odd meg. And that's what it's done. It's gone, ah, I can cache 256 uh, meg here. And that's what it said. said at the top, it said 256 meg heap. So, uh, yeah, that is interesting. So I'm guessing that's because it's running straight from the Zorro 3 RAM. Did I say Zorro 2 before? Zorro 3 RAM. Yeah? Despite the fact we've got about 64 meg of Zorro, uh, not Zorro, local 32 bit fast. That is so slow, that is ridiculous. I guess it's looking for the largest block and it's got, ah, oh, you can fit 256 meg, let's go with that. And that's obviously slow RAM compared to local fast RAM. Let's just quit out. Let's just see if there's any way to limit that. Because if you say, I don't know, if we set that to say 64 meg or less, it may then just try and squeeze it into the RAM that has the higher priority. So all working perfectly. Uh, there is a speed problem. I'm not sure if I demonstrated earlier. Yeah, Quake runs really, really, really slow when it allocates 256 meg for the heap here. Um, but the issue actually is the TF4060 Proto here. Now bear in mind, it is a prototype. Stephen hadn't got with this particular one as far as getting it working well with the Zorro, the Zorro side of things and stuff like that. So, uh, and that's reflected in the benchmarks. So I'll show you a screenshot here. At the top, you can see Liv's card is not reporting at very fast speeds, actually. Uh, now, I think a general rule of thumb from what I've read online is it's unusual to get more than, say, up to about 95% the speed of the onboard memory, you know, the SIMs. That's obviously going to be, you know, there's a bottleneck there, yeah? So Liv's card is performing uh, extremely well. Some of the cards out there only give you about 50% of that. So what I'm going to do, as you can see here, just fit the 4060 of mine. Just based on the fact that the, hang on, I can't see what I'm doing here, the uh, GAL code on there could be later than the versions that's on Andy's, yeah? This might be more up to date, I don't know. So we'll give it a try with that. So it's worth doing this test to see if these 3640s perform the same as each other. Because um, it's something I don't think I've ever done. <laughs> this is Liv 2's capture on his 4000, I think. It could be his 3000. Uh, yeah, that top one there. So he's getting like 9.1. 9.4, 9.3 on the reads. I'm getting 3.9, 7.8, and 8.2. So there's a difference there. And then he's getting 4.7 on his rice, and I'm getting like a lot more on rice. Right, I'm really confusing myself here, and you may be screaming at the camera. The uh, addresses were not right, I think. Things are moving around the system when I'm changing different components here, and I think that's messing me up. Because, yeah, that's, uh, and it starts at 4.0, not 4.1, but anyway, that's where they suggest just use that range. And we've got some figures there that 
approximately right now. They're a bit slower than lives. I'll overlay lives capture here. So we had slightly faster reads and slightly faster writes. Right, that's with Andy Tricklebank's 3040. I'm now going to uh, swap over to mine. So they now seem to be the same, which is good news. It still doesn't explain why Olive's got a bit more performance <laughs> than me. Uh, I don't know, I've got a Rev uh, 11 Buster in here, is that something to do with it? Anyway, at least that's consistent. So uh, this time, just because we can, <laughs> we've got, got to go faster, and I've got to go faster. Zora 2, Zora 3, 8 meg. 256 meg. I thought, I'll just have a look at the performance of that. I don't think I ever did a bus test on that before. And that has worked, you can tell straight away, because it's got 286 meg. So if we just go into sysinfo, I just want to see where that uh, ball sits. So I've got 16 meg of sims, 256, 8 meg, there we go. So it starts at 2 and 5, to the right. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, I fully understand the way the memory is laid out on the Amiga actually. Because it doesn't start at the 0, zero does it? It starts at like 2, zero, you know, on the end, the last two digits. So I've just jumped it up a number of bytes there and uh, now it's doing it. So yeah, we're, as expected because of Zorro 2, we've got you know lesser bandwidth here. So 2.2 on the reads here, this is on the old 8 meg gotta go fast card. Yeah, and seemingly the same sort of speed for the rights. Anyway, it's good that that does actually work. I guess the other thing we should do here, look at that right there, that was exponentially faster. 14.2 on that right M. I'm not sure what right M is, I'm guessing that the W is word, L's long, M is... Mm, I'm not sure. But anyway, that is uh, a lot faster, that, that final one there. That's significantly faster. What I was going to say is let's get the A3630 in, the, you know, the CPU card that came with these. Or is it a 3430? I forget. So, booting from the 030 here now. I hope this boots. <laughs> I'm, I'm never sure. Because when you've got the libraries and things installed like that for the, o, oh, there you go, the 040 and the 060, it can cause it to balk. I think that's faster, isn't it? First one, not so much. I don't know, we're approaching like, you know, 9 megish there. Yeah, that, look at that one, that's much faster. So this is the thing, see. So the 030, yeah, there's some, there's a, a, a drop on one or two of those there, but actually overall, that is faster. That is faster. And of course, we're looking at the Zorro 3 card there, just now. If I do the same thing for the Zorro 2 card, I forgot what it was, no, it was 2, wasn't it? It started with 2. It was, uh, zero, it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, so it was like that, and then I had to go back and change the last two digits there just to bump it up so that it was within the range. So this is the Zorro 2 card now, the original got to go faster than the Zorro 2 one. Consistency across the board there on those 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3. 2.3, that's uh, mysterious, isn't it? So that's what happens with the 030. Bear in mind, this 030 has got an MMU, so I'm not sure if that's confusing matters or what. So you haven't seen the video on this yet, but this is the quad doubler. So this is with a 3640. It's given us 50 megahertz. Quite a nice little boost in performance there, actually, I think. The thing is, I've seen that many benchmarks here. Oh, hang on, that's slow. Yeah, I've seen that many benchmarks here. I'm probably confusing myself to a degree. Yeah, it's interesting the writes are a bit slower there. Anyway, that's that. So, testing with the 040 again here, you'll see that uh, Quake runs an awful lot better now, actually. So, the problem there was the TF4060. It's a proto, remember. Uh, now this is obviously using the uh, you know, 256 mega RAM, and you should be able to see this here. At the top it says 255.8 megabyte heap. So just give that a sec. Yeah, it does run a lot better. Now bear in mind the 040 is slower than the 060. So it's, you know, it's, nowhere, it's not gonna run anywhere near as well as it does on the 060. Uh, but because that RAM is accessed uh, a lot faster, I mean, it doesn't look it, you can see it's, it's still a bit of a slideshow, but that's down to the 040 more than anything. But the RAM throughput there is much better, as you saw on the benchmarks. So I think when Stephen eventually perfects the TF4060, it will be the opposite. It will be way, way, way faster on the 4060 with uh, a card like this one from Live 2.
But anyway, yeah, that is actually faster than it was with the ETF-4060, believe it or not. Yeah, so still a bit of a slideshow, as you can see, certainly when you get explosions and things. But it runs so much better with the A3640 and uh, this 256 meg RAM board than it did with the TF4060 Pro 2. But as the TF4060 continues through development, that won't be an issue. You know, there is an Achilles heel here with the 4060. I covered that uh, you know, regards the Pro 2 there in the, the video for that. That uh, the Zorro stuff was... Uh, well, as you can see, it works, but it was like significantly slow. But internally, the TF4060, this is the 460 obviously, but internally the TF4060 Proto runs super, super, super well, certainly when using the local RAM. So I think we'll get into the ultrasonic next. It's a bit, you can see, so flux in various places. So yeah, it goes in and out really well. So it's, uh, you know, the board is precision here in terms of the edges. Uh, and it looks beveled to me. Yes, it is. So it's uh, beveled there as well and around the edges. But it goes in and out really easily. But you can see there's a few hairs, bits of dust, some smears and stuff on here. I really need to change that IPA, don't I? It's like, look at all the contaminants at the bottom of that from the cleaning they've done in the past. Yeah, I'll probably uh, get rid of that after this, I think. And, but anyway, because it moves around. As soon as we switch it on, that all move around. But it doesn't stick to the board. I don't know how. Because everything I clean in here still comes out absolutely spotless. So let's uh, just bung that in. And switch it on. Oh, wrong one. Don't heat it. And there's a final look at the board. It looks like a bought one, doesn't it? <laughs> it's incredible. So, yeah, huge thanks, Suma. This is amazing. And the performance, I think, is really good. It didn't look that way with the 4060 Proto, but it is a Proto. It is that. It's a prototype. But with the A3640 and even with the 030, the performance is pretty good. As I said earlier, some of the other Zorro 3 RAM cards, you're lucky if at best you get like 95% the speed of the sim, you know, the sims. So I think this is absolutely amazing, wonderful job. Uh, and the parts, it's pretty cheap to build. I think the most expensive parts on here is going to be this RAM. The CPLDs are getting harder to find now, these Xilinx chips, but I've been buying these from uh, eBay. You're coming direct from China, and uh, they all seem to be genuine actually. Uh, I've had no problems with the last batch of maybe 10 of those. So, wrist strap on again. Let's get that in. I'll try and not get smeary fingerprints all over the blooming thing. Yeah, it goes in really well. I wish my SID card went in as well as that. I do need to shave the edges of the SID card a little bit, and that SID card is looking a bit dusty actually. A few hairs and things. In fact, the whole machine's looking a bit dusty. It's just because of the top off and it's been out here for a week or two while I've been doing various videos. Uh, anyway, so yeah, only a super short video. I still haven't worked out what these lines are. <laughs> Comments down below what you think. There's not much more to show on this. This is the thing it's a RAM board and it works. <laughs> and you've seen the speed of it. So it's like, well, what else can we do? I've not got any of the Zorro 3 cards to test alongside it really. Um, yeah, we've done everything we can, so so a huge, huge, huge thanks to Matt Harlem, not just for producing this, but for sending me the board with the RAM and stuff, and the, the, the passives and what have you, and the buffers and stuff there. I did have to source the CPLD, but as I say, you, the ones on eBay from China, they seem to be okay. So a huge thanks to all my patrons, including Live2. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee, Patreon, and merch links below. I'll catch you in the next video.